This talk was given by Roshi Rafe Martin, guiding teacher of the Endless Path Zendo, a lay Buddhist community in Rochester, New York. Join our practice, in person or online, at EndlessPathZendo.org. Uh, so today is Saturday, October 26th. After the Teisho, we will have our Hungry Ghost Ceremony uh, offering to uh, the hungry and thirsty spirits who are always tormented. Uh, and we will also be bringing uh, 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 dry goods to the altar to distribute to food shelters in Rochester. First, a brief introduction. As Halloween and the election uh, draw near, uh, I'm, I find myself thinking of the army of the dead in The Lord of the Rings. Remember those ghostly beings who returned to turn, to returned uh, to turn the tide against Sauron and Mordor. So many young men and women uh, gave their lives in World War II, fighting fascism, fighting Nazis. They believed in democracy, in a government by and of and for the people. I do hope that their spirit will return to remind us of our national aspirations and of the sacrifices made by so many to help make those aspirations real. Uh, maybe uh, this Halloween or shortly thereafter, we can put some old ghosts to rest. Now, a bit of background. In Buddhism, hungry ghosts or pretas live miserable lives in one of the six realms of unenlightened existence, Hakuin's chant speaks of we endlessly circle the six worlds. Uh, we ourselves go through all these realms, hungry ghost, human, God, warring spirit, hell dweller, and hungry ghost uh, every day. But uh, in the Praetor or hungry ghost realm, the beings there have swollen bellies and throats thin as needles, so their hunger can never be satisfied. They see and they want huge helpings of food, but their throats are too small to swallow the large amounts they want, and their bodies are too wasted to digest it. What's more, it's said that when they try to eat things, they turn to flames or pus. Uh, it's never what they really want, uh, but they keep trying again and again and are always unsatisfied, starving for things like love, respect, happiness or just for anything and everything that someone else might have that they don't. They are driven by cause and effect to always want, 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 but never have. As I said, it's a condition we all encounter at times, but hungry ghosts live there permanently, interminably. That is, until their karma in that realm is exhausted. Uh, <clears throat> yet, they can be helped. Their constant condition of seeing their own glass is always near empty and everyone else is always unfairly, wonderfully full, can be assuaged. How? By offering food and drink to them with a mind of dharma, a mind of vast, empty compassion. This food they can eat and be nourished by. They are receptive to dharma and so Buddhists teach even in those awful realms. Uh, when we turn the computer around later for the ceremony, you'll see uh, there's a reproduction of a Japanese scroll of Buddhist teaching in the realm of hungry ghosts. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a Tonka reprodu a reproduction of a Tonka. A Tonka we have downstairs, actually. Where you come up to the Zendo of the six realms and a Buddha in each of the realms. And the hub of the, the wheel of birth and death is being driven around by greed, anger, and ignorance, what arises from our sense of separation. Without that sense of separation, greed, anger, and ignorance fall away. Uh, so this is a very telling communication. The Buddha supposedly said that every place of practice should have a wheel of life showing those six realms and the causal conditions uh, that lead to each. Uh, but for hungry ghosts, uh, uh, we might say, in the view of Buddhist tradition, they are not terrible or scary or terrifying. They're actually pitiable. They suffer constantly and are constantly frustrated. Everyone else's grass is always, always greener. So today we will offer food along with Dharma words and prayers to ease 
their never eased self-created pain, the painful karma that causes them to continually cause and know only misery, never contentment or satisfaction. And in this, they harm not only themselves, but also others. So to enter the Teisho proper, thoughts, actions, understandings, perceptions, realizations that had once seemed good enough may in time no longer feel sufficient to us and then ghost-like they return to haunt us. But maybe they return not to block our way but to give us another chance. If so, their appearance may not be reason for disappointment but an opportunity to mature further. With Halloween on the horizon, uh, we'll look at Master Bai Chong and the Fox, koan case number two of the Gateless Barrier. Seen in a Halloween light, it becomes a shape, shape-shifting encounter between times and realms, bringing us there and back again, but now a bit freer, a bit transformed. The case goes as follows. Whenever Bai Chang gave a Taisho, an old man was always there listening with the monks. When they left the hall, he would also leave. Then, one day, the old man stayed behind, and the master asked him who he was. The old man replied, I am not a human being. In the far distant past, in the time of Kashapa Buddha, I was the head priest on this mountain. One day, a monk asked me, oh, hold on one sec, did I hit record? I did, okay. Uh, I was the head priest on this mountain. One day a monk asked me, does an enlightened person fall under the law of cause and effect or not? I answered, such a person does not fall under the law of cause and effect. Because of this answer, I was reborn 500 times as a fox. Now I beg you, Master, please say a turning word on my behalf and release me from the body of a fox. He then asked Bai Chang, does an enlightened person fall under the law of cause and effect or not? Bai Chang said, such a person does not evade the law of cause and effect. Upon hearing this, the old man immediately was deeply enlightened. Bowing, he said, I have now been released from the body of the fox. The body is on the other side of this mountain. I wish to make a request of you. Please, Abbot, perform my funeral as for a priest. The master had the Eno strike the Han and announced to the assembly that after the midday meal, there would be a funeral service for a priest. The monks talked about this among themselves, wondering how this could be since everyone was fine and there had been no one in the Nirvana Hall. Uh, which is like the infirmary. After the noon meal, Bai Zhang led the monks to a rock on the far side of the mountain, and there, with his staff, he poked out the body of a dead fox. He then performed the cremation ceremony. Now, part two, essentially, that evening, Master Bai Chong took the seat, the high seat before his assembly, and told the monks the whole story behind why they just did this funeral service for a priest for a dead fox. Wang Po stepped forward and asked, the old man failed to give the correct turning words and was made to live as a fox for 500 lives, you say. If, however, his answer had not been incorrect each time, what would he have become? Bai Chang said, just step up closer and I'll tell you. Wang Po went up to Bai Chang and slapped him in the face. Bai Chang clapped his hands and laughed, saying, I thought the barbarian had a red beard, but here's a red-bearded barbarian. Wu Men's commentary, not falling under the law of cause and effect. Why should this prompt 500 lives as a fox? Not evading the law of cause and effect. Why should this prompt a return to human life? If you have the single eye of realization, you will appreciate how the former head of the monastery enjoyed 500 lives of grace as a fox. Woman's verse, not falling, not evading, two faces of the same die. Not evading, not falling, a thousand mistakes. 
10,000 mistakes. Couple of notes, Bai Chang, uh, we high, his dates are 720 to 814. In Japanese is Yakujo. Kashapa Buddha is the sixth of the seven Buddhas of antiquity, Shakyamuni Buddha being the seventh. Kashapa and the five preceding Buddhas are non-historic or pre-historic Buddhas. A turning word is a word or phrase that helps open one's inner eye of understanding, turning delusions into enlightenment. Uh, the Eno is the lead chanter. The Han is a wooden board instrument uh, suspended by cords outside the Zendo, struck with a wooden mallet before Zazen and ceremonies. We simply use it here because we're so small, a wooden uh, mokyo, the little wooden fish, to do the same thing as the Han. Uh, and Wang Po's dates are died 850 in Japanese, became a very important teacher. Uh, Japanese, his name would be Obaku. So, uh, this important koan occurs quite early in our curriculum, being case two of the Wuman Kwan, gateless barrier, Japanese would be Mumon Khan. So it's essentially uh, a checking question on Mu, which was, of course, Zhao Chu's response to the inquiry of case one. Does a dog have Buddha nature? In practice, though, this follow-up doesn't come immediately after Mu as we first take up Mu's checking questions. And then the first gate of Zen is taught by Aiken Roshi requires after that, uh, we respond appropriately to, appropriately to several brief koans. And then we first examine the 50 or so so-called introductory koans. And only then do we come to this koan of the fox, where wily old Wu Men waits for us with some excellent challenges. The koan begins in an ordinary enough way. Master Bai Chong is giving Taishos to his Sangha. One day, clock time falls away, and the deep past becomes accessible. There are such moments. While the koan might be fiction, it's not pretense. Aiken Roshi suggests that Bai Chong may have come upon a dead fox and thought, here's a way to turn the Dharma wheel. With it, we can look into karma and essential nature. And he brilliantly created this story. Fiction can be a route to reality. Looking through a telescope at the night sky, aficionados recommend that we don't look directly into the eyepiece, but use what's called averted vision. That is, when looking into the scope, we should look from the side of the eye, not straight on, in this way, we make the best use of the physiology of the eye and its light gathering abilities. We will see more with greater detail than if we looked straight on. Fiction does the same for the mind's eye. Emily Dixon, Dickinson wrote, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. So Bai Chang meets an old man who is not a human being, trick or treat. He wears a human costume, but he's really a fox or a fox spirit. In Asia, fox spirits are seen as uncanny, supernatural emanations, tricky and misleading. So the koan begins with shape-shifting, but then removes another mask become more intimate still. Pai Chang actually, it turns out, is encountering not a fox, but his own earlier self, is how Aiken Roshi sees it. A human falls into the non-human, and then the non-human is revealed not only as human, but as myself. Hard boundaries dissolve. The oddity continues, for in this koan, we've gone so far back, we're not even in our own world cycle anymore. We're back before Shakyamuni Buddha was the Buddha, back in a distant world age when the historic Buddha was known as Kashapa, one of the seven past Buddhas, uh, or one of the six past Buddhas before Shakyamuni, long before our cycle of history on this planet began. Back then, old Bai Chong, the former head of the same monastery, was asked an essential question about enlightenment in relation to cause and effect, or karma. Does enlightenment free us from the travails of karma? 
Is that the point of enlightenment? No more bondage to cause and effect. Does the enlightened person fall under the law of cause and effect or not? This is a good question. If enlightenment is freedom, what kind of freedom is it? Old Bai Chong in that past world age gives the classical Buddhist answer. Yes, he says, enlightenment brings freedom from cause and effect. Isn't this a very good reason to practice? Who wouldn't want that? In fact, according to tradition, this is often why people might practice. It is the hope of becoming free of all that binds, getting beyond the often deeply painfully consequential effects of our own past unskillful thoughts and actions. Maybe this is what drew us to Izendo and to the sitting mat as well. Caliban, a fascinating witch-born monster of Shakespeare's remarkable late play, The Tempest, chants at one point, heyday, freedom, freedom, heyday, ka, ka, Caliban, get a new master, be a new man, get a new master, be a new man. That's what he hopes for. Bravo for him. After that, anything goes. He's free to do and get whatever he wants. Many people feel that this is what freedom means. Only maybe it's not so simple or so literal. Is the enlightened person free of cause and effect? I ask again. What is this great freedom, yours and mine, that Zen offers, that life offers? For as we see the outcome, the effect of this traditionally correct, traditionally Buddhist answer isn't what old Bai Chang expected. With his answer, he's turned into a fox. And not just once, but 500 times. Now, this same old Bai Chang stands before his present self and asks to be released from the effects of his rather unsubtle past era. Please, he asks, of the current Bai Chang, can you offer a more correct, more subtle, more accurate response, a turning word that will free me from my fox body. Pai Chang has grown. He can see that what was good enough earlier is not good enough now. He has matured and calls himself to task. He must clear up an old era of understanding and put an old ghost to rest. We've all been there. Old views get outgrown and will long, no longer do. A point not in the koan, but worth considering, is that there are consequences, not just to our thoughts and deeds, but to our understanding as well, which we then must live out as our lives. For example, if we believe that we are ultimately and irrevocably separate and alone and isolated from wind, rain, bugs, trees, animals, people, rivers, mountains, seas, then that is the reality we will live. It is the karma we create for ourselves. Living with such a sense of isolation, then naturally coming from that, we will experience effects such as anxiety, aggression, competitiveness, greed, hatred, all of that inevitably follow. If, on the other hand, we believe that the Buddha was not a fool or a liar when upon his great enlightenment, he spontaneously exclaimed, wonder of wonders, all beings are Buddha, fully endowed with wisdom and virtue, we can then begin to work on turning that reality into our own personal experience. And we will experience the effects or karma of that sort of cause when to even a slight degree the 10,000 things step in and confirm the self, the actualities of how we live shift. Thought and insight and action all have their results. In the shift, 
dramatized in this koan, foxiness becomes fully human. So does an enlightened person fall under the law of cause and effect or not? We know that we fall under the law of cause and effect. We lie and the lie comes back to bite us. We are inattentive and eat something that we know disagrees with us and as a result have to cancel long held plans. But what about a fully enlightened person? Do things like that happen to them too? Maybe we've read books that the enlightened person can fall into fire and not be burnt, fall into water and not drown, lose money and not worry. Why wouldn't we then think that's for me, freedom, heyday, heyday, freedom. But what's wrong with old Bai Chang's response that yes, the enlightened person is free, cause and effect. Why does it turn him into a fox? And how about young or current Abbot Bai Chang? He's been given by cause and effect itself a chance to refine an old inadequate understanding from long ago. Not days, days or weeks or years have gone by, but entire kalpas have passed since that long ago time, and he has matured. His once adequate view will no longer do. Can his realization move from a concept to the personally intimate? What will he say? He steps up and answers his old self with, the enlightened person does not evade the law of cause and effect. With that, old Bai Chang is released from his fox body. But here's a question. How does this answer revive the dead and kill the living and restore old Bai Chang's lost humanity? How would you put it? How will you show it? In any case, our current Bai Chang, having administered truth's first aid to his ghostly foxy self, now heads off to poke out the corpse of his old era and cremated at last in a funeral service for a monk or a priest. What's that about? Hakuin raises this question, and he really wants us to answer. He says, how can Bai Chang perform a monk's or priest's funeral service and cremation for a hairy, dirty, old dead fox? A monk is clean shaven and wears neatly pressed robes, but a fox, well, a fox is definitely not like that. Hakuin adds that this question is just as important as that of whether the enlightened person falls under the law of cause and effect or not. What's going on with that? And what's the real difference between the two answers of not falling and not evading? How do we show this in terms of the koan and how in terms of our own life? Now we begin to see how Zen differs from other schools of Buddhism. We must uncover our own realization, not depend on the very good, maybe even brilliant ones we found in various inspiring books or podcasts. We must find our own understanding, poor as it may be, and then we must live it. In the Six Patriarchs Platform Sutra, a Chinese, not an Indian document, Wei Nung, the Sixth Patriarch of Zen in China, says to his audience that he is only there because of the causes they all planted. And they are there hearing the talk that he is giving right now because of those same causes. The causes they planted in the distant past gave rise to the Dharma gathering at which he is now speaking and is the expression of their mutual cause and effect. Who we meet in life, who becomes our life partner, who we live with, who we pass in the street, who we practice with, who we work with, who are our parents and who are our children, all of it is a living expression of cause and effect. Our whole life is cause and effect. 
Aitken Roshi told me that in Japan, karma or cause and effect is really termed mysterious affinities. If we think that karma is a bad thing, we need to think again. That would be a wrong, boorish, and misguided view. In light of this koan and his question of whether an enlightened person falls under the law of cause and effect or not, or not there's, this, there's this little eye opener that comes out of the Nepalese Buddhist Jataka tradition in which the Buddha talks about his own 10 sufferings, ailments, and difficulties he faces and has now as the fully enlightened Buddha. And in this little known text, he humbly traces back the cause of each one of his current ailments and difficulties to some specific distant past life in which he, as an ordinary deluded person, tried to get ahead in life by committing terribly self-centered deeds, straight out lying, straight out cheating, even murdering business, athletic, and love rivals. Though his practice has matured endlessly since such distant and flagrantly self-centered times, he still carries the karmic residues and must pay the price, even as the awakened Buddha. But there is a difference. What is it? Might the koan of the fox clarify it for us? So, to return to our fox call, with this case drawing on past lives and mythic events, Wu Men wants us to clarify the nature of freedom and see into what cause and effect or karma and essential or Buddha nature actually means. Whether realized or unrealized, whether fox or human, our whole life is in this koan because our whole life is cause and effect. Zen koans and their mondo or dialogues are the jazz duets of Buddhism. Bai Chang reveals his teaching in a wild jazzy riff on a fox. Wang Bo steps up and taking a solo brings it home, accenting the beat, syncopating the rhythm. For the sake of creating a good story, Zen tradition says he slapped his teacher, but Simultaneously, Zen tradition warns that in reality, he did not slap him for real, but mimed it. Wang Po was said to have been a giant of a man some seven feet tall, while Bai Chang was a wizened old priest. One slap would have sent him flying. Also, to slap one's teacher destroys all monastic proprieties. Zen offers freedom, but tennis with no net is no game at all. So, women's commentary, not falling under the law of cause and effect. Why should this prompt 500 lives as a fox, not evading the law of cause and effect? Why should this prompt a return to human life? If you have the single eye of realization, you will appreciate how the former head of the monastery enjoyed 500 lives of grace as a fox. Well, there it is. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. Woman's verse, not falling, not evading, two faces of the same die, not evading, not falling, thousand mistakes, 10,000 mistakes. Is there a life without mistakes? Can we ignore cause and effect? How are not falling and not evading two faces? One die. Fox or man, woman, priest or layperson, successful, unsuccessful, sick or well, happy or sad, full of thoughts or beyond thoughts, enlightened or unenlightened. How are we whole and complete and free, not in the imagined future? when we are fully enlightened, but right now. Here is what authentic Zen aims to help us do. Awake to the intrinsic freedom that right now, in the complex mix of issues 
that are my life is my birthright. Uncovering this birthright is worth a mighty effort, even if it takes us like that old and venerable worthy Fai Chang, endless kalpas. In the Three Pillars of Zen, Yamada Koan, who in time would be the Zen teacher, Yamada Koan Roshi, adds in a PS in a letter he wrote to his teacher after his own profound initial awakening, that American was asking us whether it is possible for him to attain enlightenment in one week of session. Tell him this for me. Don't say weeks, or rather don't say days, weeks, years, or even lifetimes. Don't say millions or billions of kalpa. Tell him to vow to attain enlightenment, though it take the infinite, the boundless, the incalculable future. Don't say millions or billions of kalpas. Tell him to vow to attain enlightenment though it take the infinite, boundless, incalculable future. That American, of course, was Philip Kaplo. Ripening karma, cause and effect, initially brought him to Japan to, to be the chief court reporter, for the, court reporter for the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. And then it brought him back to practice. If we're not awake, not intimate with this breath, this count, this koan, this move, this moment, we are like ghosts. We ourselves are like ghosts. In his commentary on the first koan of the gateless barrier, Zhao Chu's dog, Wu Men, says that ghosts must cling to bushes and grasses to get by. He means that we, Cling to names, ranks, concepts, philosophies, ideas, opinions, possessions, resentments, bank accounts, identifying with such bushes and grasses in order to make our ghostliness feel substantial, solid, and real. When we are ghostly, inauthentic, or fox like, what helps us find or refine an authentically human life? Woman adds, if you have the single eye of realization, you will appreciate how the former head of the monastery enjoyed 500 lives of grace as a fox. He enjoyed 500 lives as a fox as lives of grace? What's that about? In his final comments on this koan in his book, Gateless Barrier, Aitken Roshi writes, when I was living in La Crescenta, California, <clears throat> attending Senzaki Nyogen Sensei Zen meetings in East Los Angeles, on weekends, I used to walk up a dirt road into the National Forest. One day I came upon a, fo upon a fox, or a fox came upon me where the road bent around a little ridge. She had come trotting down from above, and I appeared from below. We both stopped and looked at each other. At that moment, the wind came up and blew a large sheet of newspaper around and around on the road in a miniature cyclone. The fox jumped on this piece of paper and looked at me with a merry look in her eye. Then she stepped off the newspaper and it began to blow around again. She jumped on the paper again and looked at me just as though she were inviting me to laugh at her great game. Suddenly conditions changed and she ran back up the road. This encounter was truly an experience of grace. When you take up Zen study, Aiken Roshi con concludes, your task is to personalize such grace in your own body. As Yamada Roshi used to say, the function of Zen is the perfection of character. We are not merely solving intellectual riddles. 
rearranging our masks, putting on our costumes, we soon head back out into the tricks and treats of our lives. Realize this koan intimately and a thousand mistakes. 10,000 mistakes, woman it says. Woman says, will be themselves our own life of grace. This is a consummation devoutly to be wished for, to quote the bard, and one that by birthright is rightly ours. So to conclude, all best wishes to the ghosts we will meet, the ghosts we are, and the various ghosts which through unflagging, ongoing practice, we will not only aid and comfort, but may at last put to rest. Early voting begins today. Rose and I are going to our voting location after this morning's practice, and we'll cast our votes. Happy Halloween. We'll stop here and uh, be ready for our ceremony for Hungry Ghosts.